Welcome to another Apollo Papyrus podcast episode. I am Aaron Apollo Camp. This episode features an author who grew up in an apartment above a funeral home and went on to be an educator and now an author. His name is Kevin O'Connor. He's the author of the book Two Floors Above Grief. And here's my interview with Kevin. Kevin O'Connor, welcome to Apollo Papyrus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Feel free to introduce yourself to our listeners. Sure. Thanks a lot. Uh, yes, Darren. Thanks. I'm, I'm as you said. I'm Kevin O'Connor. Uh, I'm here. I live here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where I've been for the lot, almost twenty years. Uh, a bulk of my life, though, was spent in uh, area outside of Chicago, where I was a educator. Uh, about 50 years. So I had some of those years in Florida too, but I had 50 years in elementary and high school and college education from 1973 to my retirement in 2020. So uh, the bulk of my career was there. Um, uh, once I retired, I uh, got started and, and finally started doing what I wanted to do in, in writing a book. And uh, uh, the book is uh, called Two Floors Above Grief. And I wrote that right here in uh, Fort Lauderdale. So some people here consider me a local author. But um, it was published in, in November of 2022. Uh, and it's a, a memoir about uh, my growing up years in uh, a funeral home outside of Chicago, a town called Elgin, Illinois. And so even though I live in Florida and I spent 50 years as an educator, the book the bulk of the the book I wrote, Two Floors Above Grief, is uh, really about my coming of age from birth on and some stories about my family who, who ran this funeral home from 1930 to 1984. Uh, so that's a little bit about myself. In summary, we'll get into more details as we talk, I'm sure. You mentioned a little bit about your book in the previous question, and without spoiling too much about Two Floors of Grove, uh, uh, Two Floors Above Grief, what is your book about? Okay. Well, I don't know. Uh, I think I'm, I'm on a screen. I'm not sure if you can see in the background there, but the I, I purport that in some cases, this book you can tell by its cover. Uh, the, the cover is the house in which I uh, grew up, a Victorian house built in 1886. And uh, the concept of Two Floors Above Grief was on the, the first floor of this house, was a funeral home that my father and my uncle had created in this Victorian house. They purchased the Victorian house in the late 30s, and then they converted it. First floor funeral home, basement, all the other things to do with the funeral home business, like a preparation room, casket room. And then the floors above it, uh, which what had been a single family home, they took over the second floor and made that into an apartment for my aunt and uh, uncle and uh, their three daughters. And then the third floor had been a ballroom in the original house with actually performance stages in the in the ballroom where uh, people would come up and listen to orchestras and uh, music and, and dance on, on a ballroom floor. That third floor area uh, became uh, the apartment that my parents created for their themselves and their family. Uh, they did that in getting ready for the birth of their first son in 1940, my brother. I came along 10 years later, and then I have a younger, another brother uh, that was born a year after me in 1951. So the, the concept of the story, Two Floors Above Grief, is to tell the stories of our family above the grief. We don't deal a lot with, I don't deal too much with the clients in the funeral home uh, or their stories. It's more about... How do two families live in, I'll call them conjoined apartments. I'll explain that in a second. They lived in, con, we lived in conjoined apartments. How do we live and get along for all those years? Uh, six kids, uh, two sets of parents. Uh, there was, for a while, there was our, a grandmother living with us. So we had, we had quite a, a group of people that had to share this space. I say the apartments were conjoined because uh, in order to get to the, where I lived on the third floor, of this apartment, I had to walk through uh, the area of the second floor apartment. So 
it it was not unusual for me to be, uh, stop at the kitchen of my aunt and talk with her or my uncle, walk through their dining room, uh, stop at their living room, uh, and then proceed on my way up to the third floor. So those two people, my aunt and uncle, really became like a second set of parents and were very, very active in, in my upbringing and my life, along with my mom and dad. So that's where the concept comes from, two floors above grief. It's set from the time, like I said, uh, my, they started the business in 1930. I look at it from my own perspective as a writer from um, my birth, from 1950, up through my, my uh, 20s, 20s years when I was in the 70s. So we, I cover quite a little bit of tidbits of history from the 50s to the 70s, uh, make references to who was president at the time and what was going on nationally regionally and then locally so it's a it's a book that's taken off quite well in in our hometown and also other other places as well and it's become a it's becoming a book a resource book for people in the uh funeral profession uh as a way to study people who have uh done the profession before and also i i've been uh working a lot of different concepts that i present in the book and unpacking those as as i get on podcasts and make presentations. It's been quite a marketing year. So I'm 14 months into it and really enjoy the process. So that's a little bit more about the book. Now, I have to ask this question. Did you ever see any ghosts or anything paranormal in nature when you when you lived in this house where the where the funeral home was? Sure. Super question. And uh, the um, I'll, I'll answer just by saying no. I didn't experience anything, nor do I have uh, any known experiences from my parents, my aunt and uncle, or um, my cousins, or brothers, that they have experienced anything like that. Looking at the house, though, uh, especially on a dark night sometimes, or it has a little gothic uh, look to it, old Victorian gothic look. And so some people would think, yeah. Uh, the other thing, I haven't really done much study on paranormal, but uh one of the things to the best of my knowledge um I, there might have been prior to us purchasing the house sometime in the 1800s uh 19 early night there may have been a death in the house by one of the the uh the people that live there but really when you're looking at a funeral home the people that come are already dead so um in terms of anybody in the, in my lifetime actually dying there that didn't happen and not that that has to have any connection with paranormal. Rather a long answer to no, I did not experience any of that. I, I uh, certainly experienced the presence of, of people who were deceased in caskets and in different states as they proceeded from the entrance into the funeral home through their funeral services. So I was a, a observer for that, but nothing paranormal. I love the question. Thanks. Now, uh, who designed uh, the cover of your book? As uh, that is a very nice cover. Well, thank you, thank you. I uh, her name is Victoria Wolf, and when it came to the time, I worked with. I'm self published, and I know you've talked to your some of your other authors about that. I'm self published, so I did the things that a self published person needs to do. <laughs> Either you do that stuff yourself, or you hire people. So through a, a group called My Word Publishing, which have been, a, they've been a great help to me in getting the book published and marketed. They uh, put me in touch with Victoria Wolf. Victoria, one of, she's an artist. And uh, one of the things, one of her specialties is designing book covers. So we consulted together. She uh, asked for a, a copy, a, a picture of the house. And I happen to have this one that's on the cover. It was a sketch of the house done in 2009 for a house walk in the town of Elgin. They do a house, they do a walk and feature eight to 10 houses every year uh, that are hist of historical significance in the town. And 2009 was, uh, they were featuring this house. So she went and did a sketch of the house as it had looked at the turn of the century. So I got, that's how I got that. And then in the background, um, the book is based on 700 uh, pages of letters that were written back and forth between my parents and myself, my aunt and uncle and myself, cousins, uh, 
And those, provi those provide uh, a base or a foundation or a reference to a lot of the stories I tell. I'll often make a reference to the actual words uh, in those letters and it gives a real authenticity to those characters. But back to the cover, Victoria took, uh, I had taken the, the letters, a lot of the letters that I had and made like a collage of them and, and laid them out on a t tables and took pictures. Had a photographer help me with that. And uh, Victoria took those and laid them in the background of the picture of the house she had. So when you really look closely at the cover, it's sometimes it looks like those, uh, they look like clouds. But actually, it's the, that's the letters and the stamps and the envelopes of this collection of, of correspondence that I have. So it really, it really uh, when she came up with this, this design and we talked about it on the phone and then we got into color schemes and things like that. But just the whole concept of the, the stories themselves come from the letters. And those are just they sort of uh, provide a, a sky around the house itself. So, yeah, I love the cover. I love the cover. What were the easiest and most difficult parts of writing a book for you? Okay, easiest. Well, I guess part of the thing, if you look at easy, I don't think there's anything really easy about writing, but it certainly brings me joy. I've been writing all my life, um, in my in, in my youth, and I was I always always drawn to writing as a high school and college student. Um, and I just, I, I, and in my profession as an elementary teacher, principal, uh, university professor, and I wrote a dissertation. So I've done a fair amount of writing. And I, what's easy about, I'll just talk about this book. What was easy about this, writing this book, was I had the stories in my head. I had these letters. I had all that. I had the, the resource. I had the memories. I had all that. It was ready uh, and ready to, to burst out. The difficult part, uh, which I think some of your other authors have shared, the difficult part is just the discipline. And uh, I was fresh off fifteen, fresh off, fresh off fifty years of uh, professional life and education, and then now I finally I had this time. Now I I didn't have the excuse anymore to say, oh, I got to work. Or to me, it was an excuse. Other people I know juggle a full time job and writing. For me, uh, in terms when when I was raising my family and working full time and I had these stories I just kept filing things away and then the retirement and presented itself and and so in 2021 I started writing so the difficult part uh was this how do I put all those thoughts together how do I organize them I've done like I said a lot of writing so I just write and write and, and then keep keep getting it to a point where uh whether it's a newsletter at work or my dissertation, I just keep writing until it gets to a point. But the, for this one, I took some classes to help ease that difficulty uh, from a group called Nonfiction Book School. They're wonderful. And they taught me some techniques about how to get these thoughts organized. Uh, we used a system of putting individual ideas on sticky notes. And I just kept writing individual ideas on these sticky notes. And then I would hang them on big poster paper around uh, my office here. Pretty soon I had, oh, probably about a thousand sticky notes and I would keep putting them on these uh, poster paper and then the sticky notes, um, I would keep looking at them and I'd start to see the patterns and the, the connections and I keep would rearrange them. Eventually, those sticky notes became um, an outline for the chapters of the book and the way I wanted to approach the writing. And then from that, I developed an outline. And I started to write. And then I just wrote um, this whole process with sticky notes and organizing started in uh, April of 21. Uh, it took about a month to do organize all those ideas and get my outline. Then I started writing and I wrote until uh, until November of that year, October, November of that year. And that's how I developed my first draft. So back to the question. Easy part is knowing I had all the ideas. Uh, the difficult part was how do I get it on paper and how do I organize them and, and put them into a uh, format and an order that a reader would appreciate. You mentioned uh, you retired recently and and you were and uh, I understand you were an educator for many years. What was your work as an educator like uh, from 
in the early to mid 1970s to when you retired around the uh, start of the COVID pandemic in 2020? And how did uh, education in, uh, evolve in the fields fields you worked in in that time? Whoa, wow, wow, that, that covers a lot of topic. <laughs> But certainly, let me see what I can do to, to summarize that a little bit. Um, I started, I decided, I, when I was in college at Loyola University in Chicago in the 60s and early 70s, I had taken some education classes and, and thought, I might like to do that. I was a political science major, but I was intrigued with this idea of teaching, uh, partly influenced by some members of my family who were also teachers at the time. And so I, as I, and I knew at that time that I wasn't going to be pursuing the business, the funeral home business, certainly the skills I learned there uh, in terms of uh, service and vocation helped, uh, gave me some, pro some propelling to, uh, to, to, to venture into an education career. But I started, I, I went to University of California, Berkeley uh, to get, to go to what they called a credential program in, in 1973. And at that time, California had a, a, the way they did it is people didn't have a bachelor's in education. They, um, you spent, you got your bachelor's degree in something else, in my case, political science. You applied for a program. And then when you were accepted, you started teaching. And in my program, right away, they put me in a classroom with a teacher. So you got the practical knowledge right away. We would spend being in a classroom for four days a week, and then the fifth day, Thursdays, in this case, we were at the university doing coursework and collaboration. So that launched me into my career, and I got a job at the school I student taught at in a town called Vallejo, which is uh, north of Oakland, and worked there for four years, and then decided that at that point I wanted to uh, move back to the Midwest, Elgin, where I was from, and uh, that Elgin area, and continue my education career. I uh, worked in elementary ed in a town called McHenry, Illinois. Took a little break um, for a while, decided once when my, when my kids were born in 82 and 84, and my father had died about that time, and I thought, ah, I got to try something else. So I uh, decided to pursue a uh, life ins uh, insurance sales uh, position. and did that for 18 months, two years, and said, now, nah, I was I was grateful for the experience, but I wanted to get back in education, and I became a principal. So for 21 years, from '86 to 2007, I was a principal at at two different elementary schools in the Chicago area, in the uh, in McHenry and Lake Counties, and did that. And after during the the, the prince, I loved being a principal, school principal. Boy. <laughs> That's some of, I have a lot of favorite memories of being an educator, but that that's certainly right there. And the bulk of my career was as an elementary school principal. And I, when I retired from there in 2007, I uh, moved to uh, here to Fort Lauderdale to, to be with the person who would become my husband, Leon. So I moved here because he was still, he was working here. And um, so I came here, but thinking I was going to retire but I ended up quickly getting involved in groups and organization. And within two years, I found myself fully employed um, by the Broward Public School System in Fort Lauderdale. And I uh, worked in uh, departments that focused on diversity issues, equity issues. Um, and so I worked with that and uh, worked with programs that supported uh, LGBTQ youth, families, teachers did a lot of work with that uh, here locally, na uh, statewide and, and nationally. And then also uh, worked with uh, develop developing the curriculum for all students in the schools here for family life and uh, sexual health. So we did that and did a lot of things right here at the K-12 level to do that. And that's how I and then the, then the pandemic came and we switched over, of course, to the way you and I are communicating right now. And it just seemed I was then 70 years old and I thought, uh, I think I'll retire again. And I did. And that's uh, no regrets because but then I gave me open up a whole nother realm for me to pursue this, uh, this, this second, another, I don't know if it's a second or a third or a fourth life, but now. I'm doing the writing and working on a second book and doing the marketing of this one. So that's, that's in summary, that summarized 50 years of education so, of my career.
Your uh, one final question I have, you're active with a group that's called Smart Ride that conducts an annual bicycle ride from Miami to Key West in Florida along the overseas highway, which is US-1 south of Miami. Uh, what causes does Smart Ride support? Great, good question. And uh, actually, Smart Ride celebrated its 20th year this year. And... Um, and it's final year. The, the 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 group is redirecting itself right now, but over those uh, over those twenty years, they raised uh, almost seventeen million dollars uh, in funds to give to organizations in the state of Florida to help with HIV uh, care, HIV uh, information, HIV education. So and that tied perfectly into my work at, in the school system because uh, we developed a program uh, with the, some of the funds we had from uh, Smart Ride uh, to bring HIV screening and testing right into the high schools. So we worked with community agencies and then worked with the school system and the principals at each of those schools to make these testing, uh, this testing screenings available to students. Because at the, because at the time, um, as we're talking eight ten years ago at the time, and I haven't don't have any current data, but at the time, the uh, high school students, adolescents, were some of the highest risks at the highest risk of con contracting HIV. So Smart Ride uh, was started by a gentleman named Glenn Wen Wenzheimer, and he did this because he wanted to raise the awareness of HIV. Uh, People sometimes would think, you know, it happened in the 80s. It's over now. It's not. It's not over at all. So Smart Ride was away. And, and in the biking, the, the gimmick, or that, that's, that's um, I don't want to minimize the work that we did in Smart Ride, but the approach was each rider. There were riders that would ride the 165 miles over two days from Miami to Key West. We would do fundraising. People would contribute to our ride. And those funds then were accumulated uh, in addition to the riders, which some years might have been 300 riders, some years 500 riders or more. There was probably one or two people for each rider that was a crew. And the, so the, that was another 500 people that participated. And it took a, we would start on a Thursday night with orientations, Fridays. We would start off right 100 miles on Friday. Uh, and then get almost to key, then get within 65 miles of Key West. And then Saturday, we could we would complete the ride, celebrate um, in the right in the town of uh, Key West and and acknowledge all our work and, and uh, then start planning for the year after that. So it's it was a great part of my life. I did it for 10 years. I was part of the uh, the, the closing year this year. I didn't ride. But I, I helped out in with the fundraising and uh, doing the work to support other writers and crew people. Kevin, it was wonderful to interview you, and I thank you for appearing on Apollo Papyrus. Well, Aaron, I appreciate the time you spent with me, so I could talk a little bit about my book and uh, my career, and to uh, you know, engage with you uh, with other writers. And I, I hope uh, the experiences I've shared will help other writers and. Uh, people too in terms of getting the thoughts and things out of their head to get on paper i appreciate kevin's appearance on this podcast as he was a wonderful guest to interview this is aaron apollo camp reminding y'all to write and read your passion bye for now Remember to subscribe to the Apollo Papyrus YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash at Apollo Papyrus and the Apollo Papyrus Substack newsletter at apollopapyrus.substack.com. Y'all can visit the Apollo Papyrus website at camparinapollo.witsite.com forward slash Apollo Papyrus and follow Apollo Papyrus on threads, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr at Apollo Papyrus. Copy Copyright 2024, Aaron Apollo Camp, all rights reserved. This podcast episode is intended for the private listening of our audience. Any reuse or retransmission of this episode without the express written consent of the podcast host is prohibited, except under fair use guidelines. Royalty-free music and sound effects obtained from https colon forward slash forward slash www.zapslat.com.